chapter 15. Now, Paul is uh, sending this letter to the Corinthians. They were Christians, but they came from a Greek background. They have already believed that Jesus has resurrected from the dead. But the Greeks did not believe in the resurrection. The Greeks believed that the body was evil. So why would anybody resurrect an evil body? So that teaching was starting to come into church. So Paul had to write this letter. And in chapter 15, to show the Corinthian Christians three proofs that Jesus resurrected from the dead. So proof number one, their salvation. Their salvation. It says in verse one, now brothers. I want to remind you of the gospel. That word gospel means good news. I preach to you, which you have received on and which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. So the pr first proof that Jesus resurrected from the dead is their salvation. In other words, their life has been changed. For 2,000 years, Jesus has been changing people's lives. How many know that people really don't change? The liar might stop lying a little bit, but he's still a liar, right? People don't change because if you want to change people, you got to change their heart. And no institution, no program, no organization can change the human heart. So here Paul is telling them, look at your salvation. Look at what Christ has done for your life. And if you know somebody before they became a Christian and after they became a Christian, you should know it is a radical transformation in their life, right? How can God take a liar, a drug addict, a prostitute, and then change them into a new person that they don't want to do those things anymore? So that's the testimony that Jesus resurrected from the dead, our salvation. For those of us who are saved, that have received Christ into our lives, we can testify to that. Right? Jesus has changed our lives. Nothing else changes people. Only Jesus. And that's how we know that he's resurrected from the dead. Christianity has been around for 2,000 2, years. And the Bible is the bestseller every month. Why is that? Because it changes people's lives. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about just believing in God. Many Americans believe in God, which means that they believe that he exists. The same way people believe in George Washington. How many know I believe in George Washington? He's a historical figure. I believe in Alexander the Great. He was a historical figure. But my faith is not in Alexander or in George Washington. So when the Bible talks about believing in God, it's talking about committing your life to God. Not just acknowledging that he exists, but you committing your life to follow him all the days of your life. That's what the Bible means when it talks about believing, not just acknowledging, oh yeah, God exists, but I'm going to still live for myself. Believing in God says, yes, God exists, and I'm going to live for him. I'm going to give my life over to him, and I'm going to allow him to change my life. We all have family members that we knew that were not Christians, and then they got saved or they became born again, and God has radically changed their lives, right? And we can't argue with that. You look at people's lives and you say, man, I knew this person before. They used to hang out. They used to drink. They used to smoke. They used to do all these simple things. How in the world did they just stop and all of a sudden they go into church, they read their Bible? What happened to them? Was it mind over matter that they just decided to change automatically? Or was it the resurrection of Jesus Christ that he has the power to change a human heart? No one can change. You can't change yourself. And you can't change somebody else. How many in this room would like to change somebody else? And say, man, if I could change somebody else, I would do it right now. Some of them are sitting right next to you, but, right? <laughs> if we could change somebody, you would do it right now. If I could, you can change people's sins and say, man, if only I can get this person to stop their sin, whether it's lying or gossiping or drinking or smoking or, or lying or deceiving. If we could change people, we would have a long time ago. But most people want to change everybody else, but they don't want to change themselves. And the only way they can change themselves is by committing their lives to Christ. So proof number one, salvation, what God has done for you. And that's why a preacher once said, uh, uh, 10,000 pounds of argument cannot compare to an ounce of your testimony. Because no one can argue that God changed you, right? They can argue whether Jesus exists or not and all these different, you know, arguments, but they, they can't look at your life and say, 
You have not changed if God has transformed you. Right? They can't argue with that. How does this person all of a sudden from being wicked and evil has a transformed life? What happened to them? And that's the born again experience. And before I gave my life to the Lord, I used to party, I used to smoke weed, I used to do all these things. And I always traveled with a whole bunch of people because I was always a leader. So I used to dance, you know, and play basketball. You know, I used to DJ. I did a lot of things that people kind of gravitated towards me and followed me. So when I got saved when I gave my life to Christ, they kept looking for me. Peter, when are we going to hang out? What are we going to do this Friday? Where's the party at? Remember, the DJ controls where the party's at. There's no party this weekend. The party's in church. You're walking around with a Bible. And God, by his grace, led me to lead about 30 people to Christ. They came to church with me. The party's in church. They came and they committed their lives to Christ. And now they're transformed. Some of them are pastors right now, you know, in Queens. And others are ministering somewhere else. That's the transforming power of Jesus Christ. They knew who I was. They knew the sins I've committed. I hanged out with them. They couldn't argue with something happened to Peter. Right? Every weekend was party. Now, every weekend, he can look, wait to go to church. I was so hungry for the word and for God that in a mo three months, I read the entire Bible. Because I never knew anything about God. No one ever taught me. No one ever discipled me. No one ever preached to me about God. It was unfortunately, and we have a church in Brooklyn in every corner, but no one ever said, Peter, Jesus loves you. He dies for your sins. Proof number two, the Old Testament scriptures. So this is Paul teaching the, the Christians at Corinth. The Old Testament scriptures is proof that Jesus resurrected from the dead. Now there is over 300 prophecies that talk about Jesus in the Old Testament about his suffering, his death, resurrection, and his reign, over 300. Now, what are the chances of that ever happening, right? If I told you there's going to be somebody born in California with the name John, is that believable? Somebody today in California with the name John, can you believe it? How about if I told you that he's going to be named John and he's going to be born in this hospital, is that believable? Now, if I tell you he's going to be born in, in California in this hospital, they're going to name him this. His parents' names is this, and he's going to grow up to do this. Would that be believable? No. So imagine 300 predictions about Christ, and he fulfilled each one of them. Verse 3, Paul tells him, I passed on to you what was most important of what has also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins. Just as the scripture said, or the Old Testament said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. So here, Paul is teaching the Corinthians that the resurrection of Christ was predicted thousands of years ago, over 300 prophecies talking about Christ. He's saying Christ resurrected because the scriptures declared it. We have backup. We have evidence. Of all those prophecies. So he says Christ died for what? For our sins. Christ didn't die for his own sin. How many know, and this sometimes is unbelievable, that Christ lived 33 years and he never lied. He lived 33 years, think about this, and he never cursed somebody out. Right? People can be difficult, right? They get on your nerves and all of a sudden, but 33 years and he never cursed nobody out. 33 years that he never looked with sexual lust at the opposite sex. He never sinned. We sin, and we can't imagine that. But he lived a sinless life. So he didn't die for his sins. He died for our sins, for our wrongdoings. How many know that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? The Bible says that there's not one person on the earth who always does what is right and never sins. You know anybody like that who always does what is right and never sins? Nobody. We all mess up. We all do what is wrong. We all sin. That's why Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins. But then he raised. He was raised from the dead. The resurrection of Christ. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 24, verse 44 and 47, talking about himself. He told the disciples who were still baffled about what just happened. He tells them this. When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses 
and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So the Psalms, yes, it's about Christ, some of those Psalms. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah or Jesus would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message will be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. Forgiveness of sins is only found in Christ. You can confess your sins to another human being, but they don't have authority. They don't have power to forgive you. Only Christ can forgive sins. Only Christ can give us eternal life. Only Christ can write your name in the book of life. So when one day we pass away and we end up in heaven, then our names are written in heaven. But if you reject Christ, your name will not written in heaven. How many know that we all going to die one time in this life, right? It's, it's, the Bible says it's destined for a person to die once and after that face judgment. That's something that none of us would escape. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. We all going to die. We don't know when. We know the day of our birth, but we don't know the day we're going to die. But the Bible does say that our days are numbered. God is counting down our days. So the wisest thing is to grab a hold of eternal life, to ask Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Change my life. I've been doing things my own way. I've tried to change. I went to this program and that program. I tried to alter my behavior. None of that works because sin is powerful. That's why Jesus said whoever commits sin is a slave to sin, which means you can't stop even if you want to stop. And that's why Jesus came to take away the sins of the world. If we could have changed ourselves, then Christ died for nothing. He wasted his time. His blood was in vain if we could change ourselves. We can't change ourselves, and that's why God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. God does not want anyone to perish. God does not want anyone to die and spend eternity in hell where there's torment. And the Bible says that the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. God does not want anybody to end up in eternal torment. Because the Bible says that hell was not created for people. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. That was the purpose of hell, for the devil and his angels. But when people say, I want to follow the devil. I don't want to follow Christ. I'm too young. I'm having fun. I want to follow the devil and do their own thing. And don't receive the gift of God, the forgiveness of God. Then when they die... They end up in hell, but that's not, not God's will. The Bible says that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. In other words, when somebody dies that is a wicked person, God doesn't say, good, I got him. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He wants everybody to go to heaven. He wants everybody to have their names written in the book of life. How many want their names written in the book of life? Because you don't know when you're going to go. You want to make sure that your name is written in the book of life. And number three, I'm going to close with this. What's the third proof? Christ was seen by eyewitnesses. Christ was seen by eyewitnesses after his resurrection. Verse five says this. He was seen by Peter, the apostle Peter, and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Now you can trick one person that you resurrected and deceive two people, but 500 people to see him resurrect and be an eyewitness there is very hard to deceive 500 people. Most of whom are still alive. So Paul saying, look, he appeared to 500 people and most of these people are still alive in the first century, he was saying. If you doubt and go ask these people that have saw him face to face, that, that are eyewitnesses, and they could have verified it easy. They say, okay, I'm going to ask this person. You say he saw him, let me go ask this person. So all that was verifiable in the first century. So this was not done in a corner that nobody was able to know what happened. He said, most of them are still alive, though some have died. And then he goes on to say, then he was seen by James and later by the apostles. Now, James is the half brother of Jesus. But James did not believe in Jesus when he was walking on the earth. James was an unbeliever. He even told them, look, if you want to do miracles, go in public places, show yourself to the world. And it says in John that not even his brothers believed in him. 
But once he resurrected from the dead, now it's a whole different story, right? If you see somebody that was dead and resurrected, and James became a believer when he saw Christ, and then he became a leader in the Jerusalem church. And then verse 8, after all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. There's Paul the Apostle says, I saw him myself. He appeared to Paul the Apostle on the road to Damascus. And you got to understand that Paul the Apostle did not grow up as a Christian. Paul the Apostle was a terrorist. His name was Saul. He used to torment Christians, dragging men and women to prison. That when they killed Stephen, he was right there holding the coats of those who were stoning Stephen. So he was not a believer. He was a terrorist for the Christian community. Everybody was scared of the uh, uh, Saul of Tarsus at that time. But he says, look, I saw him too, for I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I am not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. In other words, he tried to destroy the church. And Jesus appeared to him, and he got converted, gave his life over to him, and he wrote 13 letters in the New Testament. So we see that God used them in a powerful way. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me, and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles. There was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach. For we all preach the same message you have already believed. So there he's telling them, look, there's eyewitnesses. People that have seen the Lord. That's a proof of the resurrection. That there's eyewitnesses, you know, people saw him rise from the dead. And that's why Christianity has been around for 2,000 years and the devil cannot extinguish it. Why? Because Jesus said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. The devil would have got rid of Christianity a long time ago if he could have. Like in Europe, when they were burning all the Bibles, William Tyndale translating the Bible in English. And the, 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 the government used to buy them and burn them. Trying to destroy the church. But what is of God, it will always prevail. Right? Nothing is, no one can stop what God is doing. So he gives them three, three proofs of the resurrection. Number one, our changed lives. Your life is changed if you're a Christian. People see it. And if you're here this morning, you say, I want my life to be changed. I want God to transform my life. I want my name written in heaven. Well, you need to get right with God. And all you have to do is simple. Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Jesus, I repent. I turn my life over to you. You don't have to confess to another man. How many know that we're all sinners, right? We can confess to another man. He don't have power to forgive you. Only God can forgive you. So personal testimony. And if you give your life to Christ, and if you become a Christian, think about all the people that God can use in your life so that you could share the gospel with them. When I got saved, a whole bunch of other people got saved. So we're all attached to different people. Think about family members, friends, children, you know, co-workers that we know. If you give your life to Christ, God will use you to reach out to those other people that are lost without Christ. He transforms you. Number two, he shared about the scriptures. It's a proof of his resurrection. And number three, eyewitnesses. Why don't we stand as we get ready to close? And if you're here this morning... And you want to commit your life to Christ. I ask you right there, as Kathy plays some music, right there in your own heart, you know, you commit your life to Christ and say, God, I want to turn my life over to you. I just don't want this Easter just to be another Easter where we go home and eat and everybody just has a great time. God, I want you to transform and change my life. I want my name written in the book of life. In your heart right there, just ask the Lord, God, forgive me for my sins. It's that simple. Ask him to forgive you for your sins. You commit your life to him and you begin to live for him and not for yourself. Give you a moment just to do that in your own heart. And thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. God loves you with an everlasting love. No one will love you the way God loves you. And he wants to see you in heaven, but you have to make that choice. God never forces himself on people. God doesn't coerce people and forces them against their will. You have to make a willful choice to say, I want to serve God. I want to commit my life to God. And I'm just going to close in prayer, just you in communion between you and the Lord. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for everyone here, oh God, this morning, oh God, Lord, that they're created, oh God, and 
in your image, oh God, in your likeness, oh God, Father, I thank you that every one here, oh God, is valuable. Lord, in your eyes, oh God, that you love them so much, oh God, that you send your son to die for their sins, oh God. Lord, regardless of what the world has told them, that they're never going to about to anything, or you're just going to be like your father, you're just going to be like your mother, God, I pray against all those negative words spoken over their lives, Father. And I pray, Lord, that they will receive, oh God, your love, oh God, this morning, Lord. Father, that this, oh God, Resurrection Sunday, oh God, will be a memorial in their lives, oh God, that they can look back and say, that was the day that I committed my life to God, and he changed me, he transformed me, he forgave me for my sins, and look at the plan he has now for my life. Father, I pray, Lord, that your grace, oh God, and your mercy would cover everyone, oh God, here this, oh God, afternoon, Lord. Father, in Jesus' name. Help, oh God, Lord, everyone here, oh God, those who commit to you, God, Father, we pray, Lord, for our family members, oh God, that are not here this morning, oh God, Lord, but we know that they're lost, oh God, Lord, that they're going a, a wrong path, oh God, that sin has taken them far, oh God, Lord, some, oh God, that are going, oh God, through a divorce, oh God, Lord, those, oh God, addicted, oh God, to alcohol, Lord, that have lost everything, oh God. Because, oh God, that the curse, oh God, of sin and alcohol, Lord, we pray, oh God, for family members, oh God, Lord, that we know, oh God, Father, that are just straying away, oh God, Father, that are lost without you, that you will reach out to them in the name of Jesus, Lord, as we leave, oh God, and gather together with family, oh God, and, and, and begin to eat, oh God, and enjoy this day, Father, I pray that the conversation about God would come up, Lord, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you will save, oh God, souls, oh God, Father, that you will restore marriages, oh God, that you will restore families, oh God, back together, Lord, for there are so many broken families, oh God, Lord, we pray, God, that you will restore families, oh God, and marriages, oh God, Father, and children, oh God, Lord, back together in the name of Jesus, Lord, we know that you come to unite, and Satan comes to divide, Lord, we pray, unite, oh God, families, oh God, once again. Lord, in Jesus' name, God, I thank you for everyone here, Lord. I pray your blessings, oh God, upon them, that you will continue to speak to them, Lord, and encourage them, Lord, as they go about this day. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you pray that prayer and you want to receive a Bible, or you just want to let me know, and we'll let you know the next steps to take. But God bless. I love you. Enjoy the rest of the day. And God loves you. Amen. Yeah,